Fantastic. I love getting to worship with you. I love getting to hear those words. No turning back. No turning back. Um, uh, For those of you uh, who are joining us uh, this morning for the first time or maybe recently, we are wrapping up our series on the book of Ruth and what a journey this has been. I mean, what an incredible book of God. And so two weeks ago, we were in the Kleenex chapter. Remember that? And there was a string section and people fell in love. It's beautiful, right? And then last week, we were in kind of the legal section because uh, the end of chapter three ends with a cliffhanger. What does Naomi say to Ruth at the end of chapter three? Just wait. Just wait. Have you ever been there? Now, that happened to be the same week that we honored our veterans. And uh, all the military folks know exactly what that chapter means. Hurry up and wait. Nothing new about that, right? But at this point, it's out of Ruth's hands. Now, just to rewind to last week a little bit, there were three main characters in last week's story. Remember, Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. He's fallen in love. She's beautiful. And her kindness to me, I'm an older guy, right? Not because he's a troll, not because he's socially awkward, but why? Because he's a half-breed. His mom's name is Rahab, and she was a prostitute, and she was not an Israelite. And when Jericho fell, the Israelites took her first outside the camp, and then she married a nice Jewish boy. By the way, spoiler alert, this morning in our passage, we're going to meet her husband for the first time. We actually got a name to go along with uh, Rahab's husband. So Boaz has grown up in Bethlehem, and he's done well. His mom is a righteous woman. His father is a righteous man, but everybody would have known his ethnicity. Everybody would have known, oh, you're like us, but you're not like us. You're in, but you're not really in. And so Boaz uh, is so grateful. Uh, 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 Ruth comes to him. She lays at his feet, basically making herself vulnerable to him, right? A girl standing in front of a boy, asking him to love her. And he says, you're so kind. And then I got to go to the DMV. So then (laughs) chapter four is basically Boaz goes to the judicial court at the time. Where is the judicial court? It's at the gate. That's why he goes to the gate. And he has great patience. He waits there for the right people to come. He assembles the right folks. He does the practical things. Remember, sometimes practicality is a natural result of spirituality. Not always. Sometimes God will tell you to march around a city seven times. And if you're a romantic or if you're an idealist, but in particular if you're a romantic, right, we love the part of Christianity that's like, yeah, and I'll stand there and I won't have to do anything. I'll wake up one morning and it'll all be different and the sun will rise and even as it rises, there will be a bird and it will chirp and I will hear my name being called and I'll see a rainbow and a unicorn will magic, right? There's all this kind of, so if you're romantic, you just want everything to be fixed. It's like, I don't want to have to deal with the grind. Ever been there? I don't want to have to wake up and have to get my Bible out every morning. I don't want to have to pray before every night. I don't want to have to, like, be consistent. But often, practicality is the natural result of spirituality. See, it's because of Boaz's spirituality, it's because of his faithfulness to God that he is willing to go through the mundane, ordinary steps to make it right, to do what he knows to do. Literally, at some point, somebody has to go to the DMV. And he says, it's going to be me. I'm going to make this right. So he goes there. It's amazing if you look at the text when he presents his argument, it's not the argument you'd think he would present. See, if, if, if he was uh, Laban or if he was somebody uh, else in the Bible trying to like pull one over on somebody, he would have never started with, hey, there's land, right? He would have started with, you know the new Moabite girl who's in town? <sighs> you know what happens when people intermarry here, right? Yeah, I know. Crazy thing. Uh, she's with Naomi, she, they've got some land, she, you probably don't want that, it's like land, I'm not sure, right? You would do everything you could to kind of put that out there first so the guy immediately goes, no, like, no, no, whatever, that, whatever form of crazy you're presenting, I don't want that. And then maybe later on, he goes, oh wait, wasn't, wasn't there land involved there? Did I just get the wool pulling over my eyes? But that's not what Boaz does. Boaz does the opposite. He puts it out there. He says, listen, There is land available to you. You have someone that you can redeem. There is stuff at stake here. Remember, land is huge. It's important, right? Even today, even right now, some of the most contested land in the world is right there at the Temple Mount. 
So land is a big, big deal. He doesn't do that. Here's the thing. Boaz in chapter 4 does not compartmentalize his integrity. He doesn't, say, he doesn't ask the question, well, it depends on what is, is, right? I'm not saying that the opposite of Boaz is like a former U.S. president. I'm just saying <laughs> it might be. That's all. But some people compartmentalize their integrity, right? I'll be this way at home. I'll be this way at work. Well, you just don't know business, God. Business works this way. Well, you just don't know my friends. We have to gossip in order to be friends. You just don't know, know the fact that I've got to go to this party or I've got to go do this thing or I've got to go be this person over here and be this person over here so everybody feels like they're happy. Boaz says no. It's all the same. God sees everything and my integrity is going to matter to me no matter where I am, no matter who I'm pleading my case to. The kinsman redeemer that he pleads his case to is not dumb. Remember that? You read that passage, and the kinsman redeemer, he's no dummy, right? This is a guy Boaz knows. He knows he's closer in line. Remember, this is a legal system. It's a legal system. What are we going to do with the inheritance? If someone passes in your family, you got to figure out what are we going to do with the stuff? And back in Leviticus, right, when they were still trying to figure it all out, God said, here's how to work out what you do with the stuff. Here's how to keep it all in the family, So he's going through the legal system. There's somebody, there's a legal representative that's closer to me. The guy is not dumb. Would you like some land? Yeah, actually, I kind of would, right? That's a good thing. But when he then says, well, just remember, that's great. Naomi comes with Ruth. She's a Moabitess. And just remember that there's, you need to redeem this part as well. It's not that he's suddenly going, aha, got you now. Instead, he's going, this is a part of the legal transaction. And this kinsman redeemer is smart enough now, if you look at the Targum especially, he says that I don't want to do this because it may damage my own inheritance, but really he's talking about his own family, which indicates he's probably married. So this guy is smart enough to go, two wives? I don't think so, right? That's not a dumb guy. And the problem is we tend to approach people as if they're dumb. It's one of the worst things that we can do rather than elevate the conversation. Now, again, not to pick on politicians. I know they speak at a seven-year-old level. I get it. And they think everybody's way down here. But I think that the Christian ethic is to expect more of others. It's to have greater potential. It's to see the greatness in others. It's not to expect less. It's not to diminish. It's not to go, well, I secretly think you're dumb, so I'm going to patronize you in the name of Jesus. And sometimes when we're trying to share with friends... And family members, we can come across as pretty patronizing. We have to remember, people aren't dumb. But the greatest response from last week, I don't know if you picked up on this, but this is huge. I would underline this. I would put exclamations by it, right? Some of you are doodlers. I put a doodle right next to those verses. Look at what the elders say. Now, let me just remind you, we're in Ruth chapter 4. If you look at the end of chapter 4, here's what the elders say. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. Then they go on to say, and may your house be like the house of Perez. Well, that's great, Derek. What are they actually saying? Who are Rachel and Leah? These are the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel. May the Moabite woman, the person who is not ethnically one of us, and may the half-breed be as if they were born into our community, as if they were meant to be here. Redemption is at hand. Let's graft you into this family. And when they mention Perez, remember, the time this book is written is probably during the time of King David. They're literally saying, and not just that, oh, we don't just want you to be a part of any tribe. We want you to be a part of the royal lineage of King David, the greatest king in our eyes. Forget Saul. He was a mistake. But David, that's where it's at. And may you be directly linked to him. Ruth goes from this nobody Moabitess, marrying some guy who is a part of a family and they're clearly in disobedience. And now she is one of the 12 tribes. She is a chosen person of God, Boaz, who for years, well, maybe, maybe I'll never find anybody. I I know what I am. I know I'm going to follow God no matter what. 
If this is my lot, that's, that's okay. No, Boaz, may you be like royalty. It is a phenomenal, stunning, stunning statement from the elders and the people letting us know just how highly they think of them and how highly they think of this redemption process. But we're not done yet. As we enter into this last week of the book of Ruth, we begin with verse 13 of chapter 4. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. If you get to Revelation, go back. Just start over. Don't even bother. Just go back to the table of contents, okay? It's okay. There's only four short chapters. We pick up the thread in verse 13. Won't you stand with me in honor of God's word? So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to who? Naomi. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who? Oh. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. Well, wait a second here, women. Uh, Are you blind? No, it's Ruth. No, no, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So David's grandfather is Obed. Now these are the generations of Perez. Here's the lineage, the royal lineage. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. There it is. There's his name. No wonder they kept it silent. He's named after a fish. like saying trout fathered Boaz. Anyway, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Let's pray. Father God, how good is your word. Oh, what a beautiful story of redemption. And we're reminded that we are also a part of your redemption story. That we've come from many different backgrounds. Some of us have dysfunctional family lives and histories. Some of us are in dysfunction right now. But we're all broken. We're just broken. Asking for the healer to heal. And you promise us that when we're yours, we are your sons and daughters. And so we're stunned. As family members, we're stunned at your goodness and your love and your kindness. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see all that you have in store for us in your word this morning. In your son's name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, About this time last year, I had the privilege of being in Brazil for the first time. I was on a medical uh, mission trip and uh, had seen about 150 plus people uh, come to faith in God, literally one on four uh, in groups and in waves. And so it was just amazing conversations. And at the end of that trip, again, about this time last year, we went to the site, the site of Brazil, the place that was literally created for tourists like me to come And look out over the city. That place is called Christ the Redeemer statue. Uh, Some of you know it. It's iconic. It's this picture of Christ. And it's called Christ the Redeemer looking out over the city. Now, it was originally done because they felt like they needed something. Like, uh, you know, to to compete with some of the Statue of Liberties of the world. And some of the great monuments. And there's a rumor that the Jewish uh, designer of this actually became a believer in the process. History's a little muddied on it. But that's not really the point. The point is that there is this idea that Christ, who is the Redeemer, has this 30,000 foot view over us. That there is something bigger going on than anything we can imagine on our own. And so this morning, we have to get to the 30,000 foot view. But in order to get there, we have to go through these last several verses. Okay? And there are two characters in these last verses that get us to the 30,000 
foot view. It's interesting because they're the exact two characters that we started the book of Ruth with. They are Naomi and they are God. Will you obey or won't you obey? What does your life look like when you do obey? What does your life look like when you don't obey? Now, we began our reading looking at how Boaz marries Ruth and we're like, that's great. But then it gets into this idea of, but may God be praised. May his name be revered. May his reputation be protected. And I want us to come and back and visit that idea in just a second. But look at what happens with Naomi. Everybody says, well, that's like Naomi's son. So in your mind, you have to picture what it looks like to have a grandmother who has lost both her husband and both her male sons. No males in the family. She picked up a couple of daughters-in-law. One goes back to her God. The other one stays and she clings and she says, no, 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 your God will be my God. And here is Naomi. She had acted out of pure love for Ruth. Okay, we've been redeemed. The, the land is in the family. That's great. But really, I just wanted your best interest at heart. I, I, I played matchmaker. I wanted you to meet a nice guy. And you did. He's amazing. But now picture Naomi in her old age. See what God has done with Naomi. Oh, you didn't have any men. You thought the men part of it was over. Now you have this great son-in-law. But no, we're going to go one beyond that. I'm going to give you a grandson. And you can see the love. You can see the tears in Naomi's eyes filled up as she holds that baby for the first time. As she realizes, oh, you are going to get so spoiled. <laughs> Come to grandma's house. Would you like some candy? I know you're four months old, but a little candy is good for the soul, right? You can just picture her gratitude to God. And as time progresses here, the women of Bethlehem, who all know Naomi, remember, old family, she grew up in that village. They watched her come in bitter at the choices that she made. Did she have regrets? Oh, you better believe she has regrets. I've had regrets. Many of you have had regrets. You know what it is to look back and go, oh, I wish I'd made a different choice. And she went from that because of God's love to now holding this bouncing baby boy named Obed. And they are inseparable. They're inseparable. If this was the South, it'd be a grandpa, a fishing pole, and his little grandkid, right? But this is Bethlehem, and it's Naomi, and that's my grandson, and get out of my way. We are spending all day, every day, as often as we can together. Ruth is like, I love you. Can I have my child back? Naomi's like, oh, you don't really know him the way I know him. This is Obed. Obed and I have a special relationship, right? No, no, she knows. And so she's constantly in the streets with Obed. He's chasing a ball. They're going to the barber shop. They're having times together. And everybody looks around, and they say, see what God has done. It's as if Naomi has a son again. The redemption of God here spills over into Naomi's life. It, it's not just that her land is in the family. It's not just that the girl that she absolutely loves is now married. It's not just that things have stayed in the family. See, when God's redemption hits, it spills over into other areas of your life. And God has this tendency to go above and beyond your wildest imagination. Uh, when I became a follower of Jesus years ago, and by the way, it was just really, really hard for me to become a follower of Jesus. But when I said, okay, God, I give you everything, I had zero idea where it would lead. And it has led me around the planet. It has led me in situations I could not have imagined. But do you know, I never started off going, I think it'd be really great to serve and just like see the world and like be involved with some great people. So God, you better bless my ambition. A lot of people do that. God, let me dictate to you what redemption looks like in my life. Redemption looks like being debt-free, having a big house, a big car, a pretty family, being secure. Oh, by the way, I'll be so happy then that I'm probably not going to think about you all that much. But that's what redemption looks like in my life. We love to dictate those terms to God. Now, may God do that. Sure, he might. That's his business. He's done it in the past. You think about Job. You think about even Ruth, right? I mean, it's just this amazing thing. But God doesn't always redeem in the way that we think. See, sometimes when we give up, that's when God does his delivery. When we say, God, I'm just going to focus on being faithful, and I, I'm desperate for things to be different around me. But you know what? At some point, I can't control their lives. 
I can't make the decisions for them. I can't decide what is or isn't for somebody else. So God, I will be faithful and I will love those whom you have placed into my life and I will pursue righteousness with all of my heart. And Naomi has done that. Remember, we started chapter one by saying Naomi was a good woman. We end with chapter four by saying Naomi isn't just a good woman, she is a redeemed woman. What does obedience really bring you when you obey God? It brings you a grandson. It brings you this capacity for happiness you barely knew existed. What does disobedience look like? Well, it brings you consequences. All of the men wiped out. God is going to shake your world. But after the shaking is done, if we will believe and obey, God will redeem. Now, that's the beautiful ending to Naomi. And it's really, uh, it's one of the reasons why the book of Ruth is considered one of the most perfect love stories ever written. Like it comes full circle, it ends with Naomi. But the danger here is that you place all the focus on Naomi and on Ruth or even on Boaz that you miss the big picture, which is what is God doing? How is Christ the Redeemer working here? How is God interweaving out? Now notice everybody at the end of these verses knows who gets the credit. No woman is saying, Naomi, you were so smart to hook them up. Not a single woman is like, you know what? God's great, but really? (laughs) Naomi, good job. All of them are going, oh no, this is a God-sized thing. This is a God thing. This is a God, the Redeemer thing. May your reputation be protected. That's what it says when he's talking about the name of God. May your reputation, may your character, it's all about you. Uh, One person put it this way. He said, the Bible isn't as much about the redeemed as it is about the Redeemer. Uh, Another person put it this way. He says, we don't need a system of redemption. What we need to know is the person who is behind the redemption so that he can take each of our situations and redeem them separately. And God promises not only does he want to redeem, not uh, not just does he long to redeem, but he wants to break into our lives and give us a really happy, joyful ending. Now, this is not prosperity gospel. You'll hear this in other places. What God really wants is for you just to be happy. God's just interested in your happiness. Well, yes, but actually God is interested in his glory. Well, what brings God glory? What brings God glory is when we give our lives to him. How will we find true joy and happiness? Well, when our lives are in him. So it's amazing. You talk to a Christian who's going through difficult times, uh, like my mom or like others in this congregation that I know are going through difficult times, but when you talk to them, what's interesting is they say, uh-uh, uh-uh. You, don't you dare remove my Jesus from the situation. I would not give a million dollars. I would not give anything up to not know Jesus and have a happy situation. No, even in this situation, I walk with him because my joy and my happiness and my strength are rooted there. Uh, I was in a conversation just before the worship service uh, with someone who's lost someone close to them, and I can relate to that. And, and her comment was, I just don't know how people get through this if they don't know God, if they don't know Jesus. Her kids had said something similar. And I said, I don't know either. It's not that God is just out there to be comforting and religion is nice to pat you on the head and make you believe in something that my, may or may not be a delusion. Anybody who has really walked with Jesus in tough times <laughs> knows that it's the opposite of that. It's not about comfort. It's about falling. It's not about everything going right. It's about determining who makes your decisions for you even when situations seem slightly off. So it is God here who has to get the glory. So we can't wrap up our series without panning out to the book of Ruth. Now, to do that requires something called good hermeneutics. Now, hermeneutics is not like Herman the Munster. It's not this, you know, like a Herman or whatever. whatever. You know, it's not that, okay? It's, hermeneutics is just a big word to say how you read Scripture. Do you read it as poetry? Do you read it as narrative? And how you interpret the Bible is important. Why? Because people have have used the Bible to justify just about everything. They've used it to justify slavery, justify racism, justify atrocious acts in the name of the word. Now, I would argue that it's not an accurate interpretation of the word, but they don't care. 
They'll just take it out of context and decide to apply it the way they want to. So good hermeneutics is important because it helps you contextualize how do I apply the Bible. And actually, we want to help you with that. At this church, we believe the word is the filter. And if you go to the connection wall, literally across from this worship center, you'll see we provided a sheet on how do I interpret scripture. So good hermeneutics tells us this. It is narrative before comparative. Narrative before comparative. If you have a narrative passage of scripture, it is narrative before comparative. Now, before we kind of get into this, because we're about to go way out and look at some scriptures that kind of span the Bible, we need to bear in mind that Ruth is fundamentally a love story. And we approach the series this way, going through the narrative, because the narrative has to come before the comparative so that we can get the real meat of God's word. You see, what a lot of people want to do is they want to make everything an analogy. And they mean, oh, oh, I get what you're saying here. And Nehemiah said I was a cupbearer to the king. He means cupbearer to the king of kings. No, no, it's not, he means literally a cupbearer to the king. Like when they say they went off to a faraway land called the land of Moab, really that means the faraway land in my heart. As I look out over, yes. sometimes it just means they went to Moab. So we have to have the narrative in play. But to understand Ruth is to understand that there is a love story at work here. And so you can never get into the systematic theology unless you understand that the systematic part of it is contextualized by the love of it, by the relationship of it. You don't have to know everything to be a mature believer. You can be an illiterate shepherd and be a mature believer. How does that work? By understanding the priority. G.K. Chesterton uh, put it this way. He said, let your religion be less of a theory and more of a love affair. Isn't that a beautiful sentence? And so we have this love affair with God and it's shown in Ruth. is this love story in Ruth. And because we put the narrative before the comparative, it allows us now to do the comparative. Where is Jesus in all of this? Because it didn't actually mention Jesus Christ in the text. Did you ever notice that? You know, some, one person said it shouldn't even be called the book of Ruth. It really should be called the book of Boaz. And then another person said, no, no, not even the book of Boaz. It should be called the, person, uh, it should be called the book of Jesus. It's like, well, what do you, you want to do that with all of Scripture? What do you, turn in your Bibles to Jesus for, you know. I'm okay with the, the title of Ruth. Okay, God loved Ruth. It's, it, Ruth is a central figure. But she's not the main figure. Why? Because the listener of this story would have lived probably during the time of King David. Now, we don't know who the author is, but the Talmud tells us that probably the prophet Samuel was the author of this story. So that puts the dating of this a couple of generations away. Old enough that they can remember, oh yeah, yeah, I, you know, the older folks. I knew Obed back when he was a young boy, and I can testify that Ruth was real and Naomi was real. But far enough along that you can see the lineage of it. So as Samuel is writing this, the listener and the person who'd be telling this, and you would tell this in your homes, in your Jewish household, you'd tell this, you'd teach this to your children, you'd hear uh, uh, rabbis talk about this, right? Whoever's talking about the story, the minute that someone said goel, which is the word for redeemer, right? Your mind would have not just understood the narrative. Yes, he's going to kinsman redeem specifically for Naomi and Ruth, but you would have immediately thought of God the Father. It would have gone bigger for you. You would have panned out in your mind, wait, there's application here. And oh, my heart longs for redemption. So first you would have gone to the Old Testament because you live in the time of the Old Testament. Now we have all of scripture to pull from, so let's begin with what the listener would have heard. They would have listened first to King David, perhaps the greatest king in terms of that he was a man after God's own heart. So here's some scripture passages from the Old Testament, beginning with uh, uh, the book of Psalms, and then we'll go on to Isaiah, which is after, obviously, post-King David. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. They remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their Redeemer. Now, isn't this interesting? Because this is not Isaiah, which we'll read in just a second. Okay? Why is that interesting? Well, because the time of King David was a good time. Israel's been trying to get back to that time for a long time. Amen? Like, can I just get back to Solomon and David? Those were the best days. 
So this is a time where the listener, the kids in the house, the uh, adults that are reading about Ruth, that are listening to Ruth, they would have immediately gone, yes, God is, has redeemed us. God has saved us. God has brought us out of Egypt. He has brought us out of this time of wilderness. He has brought us from this time of just occupying the center to taking it to the boundaries of the land. See, they would have heard that and they would have gone, God, you redeem. Oh, Yahweh God, Jehovah God, you redeem. You save. And then later on, they're taken into captivity. A whole bunch of minor prophets come in to warn them, you're about to be taken captive. <laughs> Repent, no thanks. Repent, no thanks. God steps in nearly every minor prophet book in the Bible and says, if you'll turn back to me, their response, no thanks. And so eventually, we see that there's a diaspora. They are scattered. They are taken over. This is from um, Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes, because you are precious in my eyes. Oh, thank you for coming to my feet. You are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. Oh, God can't love us. He just loves himself. No. God loves you. And he seeks to save you. He pursues you. I give men in return for you. And from the West, I will gather you. I'm sorry, and peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the East and from the West. I will gather you. I will say to the North, give up. And to the South, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by by my name, whom I created for my glory, Shades of Ruth 4, whom I formed and made. Here is God, the Old Testament God, the Yahweh God, essentially saying, listen, when I redeem you, I make you my family. May you be like the uh, offspring of Rachel and Leah. May you be in the royal lineage. Here is God the Father saying, you're in my lineage now. I don't know where you came from. God knows where you came from. But wherever that is, you're in my family now. That's kind of cool. Now that can go one of two ways. You can be like, yeah, I'm in the mafia. You know? You're in my family now, right? No. Or it can be like, no, you're in my family now. And if I am for you, nobody can stand against you. You see, the listener would have immediately thought, okay, that's right. King David is singing about this. He has redeemed in the past. But as time progresses... The nation of Israel, the diaspora, begins to recognize the redemption of God. And they begin to focus that Yahweh God wants to redeem us. He actually does love us. And he wants the very best for us. Listen, I know some of you think God is out to get you. And maybe your world has really been shaken because he's been trying to get your attention. Because you're pursuing your own thing and trying to fit God into your agenda. Like, sure, I'll follow you as long as I'm comfortable. As long as I get to do it on my time. As long as I can get to do it with the things that I want to do. And God is saying, ah, that's not how it works. It, It only works when you give me all of you. But when you are mine, I long to redeem you. Now, we read this passage and New Testament, uh, Christians during the time of, uh, of Paul and afterward, ever, the last 2,000 years, we read it also through the lens of Jesus. Why? Well, Jesus being in nature God, we see that there's a consistent thread between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we begin to view Jesus as the Redeemer, the kinsman Redeemer. Now, there is a reason for that. There's also a reason we haven't harped on it up until now, but we need to harp on it just a little bit. Now, understand that when you have narrative before comparative, When you make your comparatives, the comparatives begin to break down at some point. Right? I mean, uh, is Jesus truly Boaz? Is he an older guy who got married? No. 
Okay. But is Jesus compared to Boaz in the fact that Jesus really is a kinsman redeemer? Well, yes. Yes. Okay, so let's ask and answer the question again. We brought this up two weeks ago. What does a kinsman redeemer do? I think last week Dan talked about what a kinsman redeemer does. But let's just go through it together and start to make the comparative to Jesus Christ. So take your left hand and hold it out. All right. Now, remember, a kinsman redeemer, take your pinky finger, right? He takes care of the vulnerable. The vulnerable, like your pinky finger. The widow and the orphan. This is Ruth and Naomi, right? The kinsman redeemer, part of his role in Leviticus chapter 25 is, I'm going to take care of the least of these in our family. If someone has to go and get them and bring them in and graft them in and continue their name, then I'll do that. Then there's the ring finger, right? What is the ring finger? Redeem them from slavery. The ring around the neck becomes the ring around the finger. Are you with me? The ring around the neck, you are in bondage, you are in slavery, becomes the ring around the finger. Then there's the biggest thing. This is your middle finger. Unless your middle finger has been chopped off and it's not the biggest thing on your hand. Typically, this is the longest thing on your hand, right? This is the land. The land is a big deal, right? It's the most important thing for some people. Ask the Israelites. Ask the Palestinians. Ask the Muslims. All right, land is a big deal. And then finally, there's the pointer finger. What's the pointer finger? Pointer finger is all about avenging. He did it. I was wronged. It was him. What happened? This guy jumped this guy who was in our family. Somebody has to go after them. And the kinsman redeemer was allowed to avenge and it wasn't murder. All right? In the Old West, the kinsman redeemer put a sheriff badge on, went out, got a rope, took the outlaw and strung him up. And nobody said the sheriff is a murderer. The kinsman redeemer took on that role. Now, what's the benefit? The benefit is you get all the stuff that comes along with the people you redeem. Right? Now, think about Jesus in this way. Does Jesus take care of the vulnerable? Were you and I vulnerable? Were we orphaned? Were we widowed? Yes, Yes, we were out there on our own. I'm in a great family and I still feel alone and trapped. I'm in a great society. I've got all good stuff. Then why am I not happy? Why am I not satiated? (coughs) I just graduated college. Why can't I get a job? Your parents are thinking, why can't they get a job? No, just kidding. (laughs) God takes care of the vulnerable. Jesus will take care of you. In that comparative, he is the kinsman redeemer. Were you ever captive to a slave to sin? Yeah. See, here's what's interesting. None of us woke up thinking, oh, I got to figure out how to lie. You never had to teach your kid or your grandkid, hey, you don't know how to do this yet. I'm going to teach you how to sin. You ready? You ready to sin? This will be Go tell your friend you think they're great, right? You don't do that. You don't do that. Why? Because sin comes naturally. You have to work at it, right? Nobody here has to work at sin. In fact, sin's one of those deals that it's like you, people toy with. They play marbles with diamonds, right? They, they just kind of like, oh, I'll just dip my toe in or my finger in. And the problem is they don't realize is that they're all in. You don't get to control whether you're sinful or not. You are a slave, a slave to sin. Why? Because you can't do anything about it. What does Jesus, the kinsman redeemer, do? He takes it from choking you to putting it on your ring finger, and he says, you are mine, and the sun, when the sun sets you free, <laughs> you are free indeed. Christ came to set us free. Well, what about the land? Like, I, I'm not getting land anytime soon, right? Well, except that there is something about the physical redemption of the planet. Did you know that one day God is going to make all of this new? And now, I, I used to walk out on my back porch and look at the Alps. There was a gondola, literally, that went five minutes from my house up to the Alps. And I can remember being just slack-jawed some days at the beauty of that. You know, thinking, Lord, I am really roughing it here. This is really tough. <laughs> Following you is really hard, all right? Let me have another piece of chocolate. Anyways, <laughs> yodeling, right? 
Do you know that as stunning as all that is, that is still not up to par? Naperville is gorgeous at times. Yesterday I was out running and I was on this run um, and I was coming back and you could see all of the city of Chicago, beautiful blue sky, and I just thought this is gorgeous and began to praise God on that and realized it's still not up to par. See, one day God's going to come in and he's going, that's enough. Stop it. I'm done. The world's not going to spin madly on today. And when judgment comes, here's, what's the, here's the beautiful thing about Scripture. It doesn't just say the end. It says, uh 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 Now let's build something. Now let's do something. Now let's redeem something. Now let's make this the way it should be. A new heaven and a new earth. Is he the kinsman redeemer? Oh, you bet Jesus is the kinsman redeemer. Does he avenge? One day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. One day there will be a reckoning and it will be at the feet of Jesus. Oh yeah, Jesus is the kinsman redeemer. Well, what does this kinsman redeemer get? What does he really want? What does he consider so precious that he would send his son to the planet? He wants you and he wants me. The God of the universe who doesn't need anything wants you and me. So it's inevitable. We've done our narrative, but as we look at the comparative, oh, Jesus, you are our kinsman redeemer. You have this capacity. Well, does Jesus qualify? Remember Leviticus 25, it says you have to qualify. It says you have to be a relative. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. That makes him a relative. You have to be free. If you're under the bondage of sin and slavery, who isn't? Only one man ever, Jesus Christ. You have to be willing in the garden of Gethsemane where he had the option to opt out of dying for you and me. Jesus said, if it's your will, Father, listen to it. I am willing. And was he able? Yeah. Jesus was able. And so we find in Scripture that Jesus really is our kinsman, redeemer. And that sounds great. Oh, I get it, Derek. I got it. I got it like 20 minutes ago. The answer is Jesus. Right? It looks like a squirrel, but I'm pretty sure it's going to, you're going to say Jesus, right? Okay. But now we have to kind of look at some of the New Testament Scripture that surrounds this. Because remember, chapter 4 is a legality. Chapter 4 is about the legal system. So let's just look at some Scripture passages. This is from the New Testament. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree. What does he do? He stands in the gap. I will legally represent them. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as what? Sons, family, yes, I'll go to the gate. Why? Because that's where I belong. I will be the legal representative for them. For in him and all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once what? Alienated. What, aliens and strangers? Yes, you who were from Moab and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Your sins were placed on him at the moment of his death. In order, why does he do it? To present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. This is Jesus the lawyer. This is Jesus legally meeting the demands of God. They're not holy. See, the reason that there's sin is it only takes one bad thought. Who will stand in the gap? And Jesus says, I will stand in the gap. I will legally represent. Now, look at this passage here. 
But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. All of the law and the prophets bear witness to it. There you are. There's your Isaiah. There's your Psalms. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. Now, here's the question. What did Ruth have to do the day that Boaz redeemed her? Nothing. There was nothing Ruth could do. She didn't have a status. She wasn't a kinsman redeemer. This is all on him. Justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be what? Just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus who gave himself for us to do what? Redeem us all from lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works, right? You don't do the work to get redeemed. You're not a kinsman redeemer. But boy, once you get redeemed, let's build a family. Now, all of that sounds great. But if we have a narrative versus comparative, what are we supposed to do? Well, what is the one thing in the book of Ruth that has to happen in order for redemption to take place? Well, you have to have a redeemer. We get that. But if there is a system of redemption, I'm going to assume there's some form of redeemer. Fair enough? What has to happen? A foreigner has to be vulnerable enough to take a risk, to sneak into the winnowing fields, to put herself at the feet of the one who can redeem her, and to say, I don't know everything. I'm not even sure about this custom. But will you have me? See, in some ways, all of us are people standing before a holy God asking him to love us. The problem is is that there are so many who are not willing to be that vulnerable. They want to argue the method no, no, no. I don't have to walk to the camp. No, no, that's your tradition. That's your, that's your deal. God's so big, he doesn't care if I lay at, if I lay at his feet or not. It's all going to work out in the end. No, no, I'm willing to bet my life on that. Really? Really? Because that is, in fact, what you're betting. See, the problem here is that there is only one way to come to God. And that is with all of you taking a risk. This is all me. That I'm going to take the biggest risk, the biggest risk of my life. God, I dare you to do more with my life than I'm able to do it. Take me. You can sound the alarm, wake up all the workers, ruin me right now. But it's worth it to know my Redeemer. What about you? I'm discovering more and more that vulnerability is the hardest thing for most people. To make that decision of saying, I'm not going to be in control, you be in control. What are you willing to go through? What are you willing to do just to make yourself available to a Redeemer who wants to redeem you. Who loves you that much.